this is the last and final talk. Uh, Dr. Tartar said she wanted to save the best for last, hence I am here. Um, but I will actually build quite a bit. Is there an echo? This sounds echoey. Is, is it okay? I actually build quite a bit on uh, Dr. Starrett's talk. Um, in terms of athletic performance, there is actually a huge volume of real world data. Uh, a lot of this is accessible on world uh, on the track and field website, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm going to do is go over a lot more detail in terms of athletic performance. Now, my interest in athletic performance actually started a long time ago, so this will date me quite a bit. If you remember in 1972, the old Soviet Union, Valerie Bortsov won the 100 to 200. It's very difficult to double in the one and the two, but he did it. And I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. So back then, you know, a lot of guys are, are fascinated by strength. I was fascinated by speed. Also, some of my other favorite athletes, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, formerly Cassius Clay. My father, when we immigrated from the Philippines to the United States, he immediately took a liking to watching boxing. So he would actually bring us to prize fights quite a bit. And then also I developed this interest in the martial arts and hence my uh, interest in Bruce Lee. He was clearly one of the fast athletes as well. Now let's talk about pioneers in women's sports. If you go back to Babe Diedrichsen, um, really almost 100 years ago, she was quite the athlete. And then you go to Wilma Rudolph back in the Olympics. She was the fastest woman in the 1960s. There are a lot of women who are trailblazers in, in the athletic field. Now it's interesting, and, and for me this seems like yesterday, but then I was thinking, wow, that's actually over 50 years ago. The first woman to run the Boston Marathon, and I wish, if you look at the picture on the top left, she's running in sweatpants and a sweatshirt, and you can barely see this old guy behind her trying to push her off the course. Women were not allowed to run the Boston. He literally was trying to physically remove her from the course. So her boyfriend, who you can see is right behind her, pushed the race director off of her. And she finished. You can see her time was four hours, 20 minutes. I mean, not great, but hey, anyone who finishes a marathon, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and it wasn't until 1972 uh, that women could officially run the Boston, which, I mean, I was a child of the 70s, so to me, seems like yesterday, but actually it's quite a long time ago. Now this really dates me. I don't know if you remember the original battle of the sexes between Billy, between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. Bobby Riggs, for those, I mean, you could YouTube this stuff. He was really more of a showman and he challenged Billie Jean King, who was the number one female tennis player at the time, uh, to these tennis matches. And of course he got killed. I mean, Billie Jean killed him. But you can say this is sort of when people started talking about you know, male versus female differences in athletic performance. Another great uh, athlete, uh, Joan Benoit, she was the first uh, female uh, Olympian. Uh, 1984 was the first year uh, that the Olympics had a marathon. I mean, just think about that. Uh, prior, this is funny or weird. Prior to 1984, there was a lot of people in the International Olympic Committee that did not think women should be running that far. So, we, I mean, women have come a long way athletically. Now I think what's even more amazing, if you look at that bottom bullet point, at 61 years of age, she ran the Boston in three hours and four minutes. That is ungodly fast. That's a seven minute mile. And for those of you who run, like I, I can't run one mile in seven minutes. She did it for 26.2 miles. That is insane. So we know that most world-class women can beat most men and women. Most world-class women can beat most of humanity. However, however, size does matter. And this is sort of takes off a little bit on what Dr. Sterrett had mentioned. I'm gonna show you a little bit of data that we've collected from, um, we get a lot of athletes going through our lab and you'll see there are stark sex differences just on size alone. For instance, look at this, height. There are a few male athletes that are quite short, but if you look, there's a pretty clear demarcation in terms of height. Look at weight. You have males that are up to 140 kilos. You're not gonna find a female that's 140 kilos. I mean, just doesn't exist. Um, and you can see most of the female athletes are down at the lower end. Not much overlap at all. Um, I can't see the left side of this. What's it? 
Oh, body mass. All right, and if you look here, body mass, again, not much overlap. Uh, percent body fat, you can see even males as a percentage of body weight have much lower percent body fat. And then this must be fat mass. I think it's fat mass. Okay, <laughs> it's like part of it is cut off on slides. If you look at fat mass, you can see it's even, more or less, but of course, males have a larger total mass. But this is the killer. When you look at lean body mass or fat-free mass, males have much, just have much more fat-free mass or lean body mass. There's, and in fact, again, the caveat here, these are athletic, this is an athletic population, this isn't general population. So when you're looking at athletes, the differences become even more stark. And then this is bone mineral density. This is one of those things that if you look at male athletes versus female athletes, female athletes are high. I mean, you're probably not used to looking at these values, but 1.2 grams per centimeter squared is high. Males, they're up to 1.6 grams per centimeter squared. So males on average, these are male athletes, have much denser bones. And for a lot of sports, especially collision sports, clearly that's an advantage. Now, what about the cardiovascular system? Um, there have been you know, people making claims that perhaps in the endurance sports, that's where women might be able to sort of narrow the, the male advantage. But if you look at the classic measure of cardiovascular capacity or cardiovascular power, elite females, their max VO2 can maybe reach 70 milliliters uh, per kilogram per minute. Elite males, a lot of them exceed 80, which is pretty high. However, <laughs> I got to put this up there because I love comparative physiology. Dogs are actually much higher than people. And that's why if you have a fat beagle, he will still outrun you because dogs have a high VO2 max, even if they're untrained. They're just aerobic creatures. Now, for comparison, Lance Armstrong's max VO2 is about 85 mLs per kg per minute. Um, I don't think there's any female, any elite female athlete that's in the 80s. They're, I think they sort of top off at 70. And that's because if you compare male versus female and you look at cardiovascular system, the male heart is larger relative to the body. They have uh, more red blood cells. They have higher hematocrit. They have greater lung capacity. So those differences you just can't erase. Now, if you look at the sort of divergence, for those people who have young kids and you, you sort of follow them as they compete in athletics, there's the divergence in terms of sex or gender and athletic performance starts at around age 12 to 13. That's when you start to see this. And, I, and people tend to feel like it's mostly related to the increase in plasma testosterone. But again, there are a lot of advantages just in terms of normal bone structure that, that men will typically have an advantage athletically over women. So what I've done here is this is real world data in terms of athletic performance. And I've picked um, track and field or running events. And why do I pick running? Well, you can't pick baseball or softball because you need a field, you need bat, you need gloves. You can't pick any sport that requires equipment, but you can pick running because it doesn't matter what country you live in, anyone can run, right? So what do we see here? And I've, I've, I've focused on the 100 because the 100 meter dash is typically, well, who's the fastest person? Get on the track, run as fast as you can. Also pick the 400 here because what's the 400? It's one lap around the track. I mean, most of us can run one lap around the track, right? And you can see that it, by age 15, high school boys can beat the fastest women of all time by age 15 in the 100. In the 400, by age 14, high school boys can beat the fastest women of all time. What about middle distance? By age 14 to 800, two laps around the track, 14-year-old boys can beat the fastest women of all time. By age 15, the mile, the fastest high school boy can beat the fastest women of all time. Now, when you get into long-distance events, you'll notice here the marathon, you don't have any high school kids beating uh, female marathon runners, and that's because there, there's no marathon distance in high school. In fact, if you're a cross-country runner, I don't think there's a single coach who would ever recommend you run a marathon in high school. Uh, but if you look at the 5,000 and 10,000, you'll notice by age 15 and 16, high school boys are beating the fastest women in the, in the world. Now the field events, um, most of you, unless you watch the Olympics a lot or watch track and field a lot, you're probably not familiar with these field events. So I decided to put some 
really cool pictures because these are actually very beautiful events. Uh, watch this, Dr. Brager. <laughs> In the high jump, boys by the age of 14 are already beating world-class women. In the pole vault, which is a beautiful event, you're running full speed, you have a pole, you put it in a hole, you fly. I mean, what a cool event. <laughs> by age 15, boys are beating world-class women. The long jump, by age 15, boys are beating world-class women. What about the triple jump? By age 15, boys are beating world-class women. Shot put, by age 15, boys are already stronger than the strongest women in the world. Now, what's interesting about the shot, and I know no one here, I'm a big fan of track and field. Um, the weight of the shot for women, I think is 10 pounds. The weight of the shot for high school boys is 12 pounds. The weight for the shot for adult men is 16 pounds. So they're already moving a larger object farther than the strongest women. And the discus, by age 15, boys are beating world-class women. Hammer throw, another cool event. Uh, boys are beating world-class women by age 14. So really by age 14, 15, you're already seeing this divergence in, in athletic performance. Javelin, which another cool event, just don't get hit by it. Um, boys are beating world-class women by age 14. Now, when you look at track, there is a consistent 10% difference between world-class male and world-class female athletes. So I highlighted here the 100 meter dash and a one mile time run. You'll notice that in the 100, the world-class record for, for, for adult men is 9.58, that's Usain Bolt, 10.49. Uh, I'll show you who the world-class holder for that is. You look at the mile, you know, there's that vaunted sub four minute mile that Roger Bannister did in 1954, I believe. Not a single female has broken the four minute mile, but high school boys routinely do it. And you can see the American high school records 353, I think it might even be lower now. Um, whereas the fastest woman in the world is about a 412, which is still really fast. Now, I don't know if anyone watched the 1988 Olympics besides me, but I loved watching Flojo. She, not only was she fast, she was one of the few people who knew how to market herself. She wore these really crazy cool outfits and she still holds the world record, 10.49, which by the way, is a lot faster than Shakari Richardson. I mean, we're all talking about Shakari Richardson because she was caught smoking pot and she can't compete, but Shakari Richardson has the second fastest time and she still would be killed by Flojo. However, what's interesting about Flojo is she couldn't crack the top 25 of high school boys on any given year. And Shakari Richardson, second fastest of all time, there are nine high school boys in Florida alone that are faster than her. In fact, South Florida, something weird about South Florida, if you go to South Florida high schools, there are boys there that are already running faster than every female on the planet. This is just South Florida. So, you guys know Usain Bolt. It'll be tough to break that record. Matt Bowling holds the high school record. Um, so I would highly recommend, if you like track, watch the Olympics because the United States may actually sweep the 100 and the 200. And I can't even remember if they've ever done that. Right now, the best sprinters in the world are in this country. It'll be amazing to watch. Now, this is a question that always comes up. Do women have an advantage, though, when you start making the event super long, ultra distance stuff, greater than 26.2 miles? And to me, 26.2 miles is kind of ultra to me. I'm like, God, that's a long time to run. But it has to exceed 26 miles, right? So the world's toughest foot race. It's called the Badwater 135. It is 135 miles of running. 135 miles of running. Valerie looks like she wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> temperatures exceeding 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It is so hot, <laughs> you know it, that they run on the white line because you, the shoe, your shoes will melt, right? So they're literally staring at the white line, running on it, shoes melt. Um, there are no aid stations, so you're like, well, you gotta get water, right? So you actually have your own crew in a van following you for 135 miles. It's a crazy race, right? For ultramarathoners, it is the toughest race of all, right? Well, what's the course record? 
Imagine running for 21 hours and 33 minutes, which, by the way, if you do the math, he's running at a pretty good clip. And actually, even for the female record, she's running at a good clip. This is not like, you know, a slow jog. This is, they're, they're maintaining a good pace. But even with ultra distance stuff, men still out outcompete women. Now, people say, well, women are better at oxidizing fat, which is true. Men are better at oxidizing carbs, which is true. However, you still have to overcome all the other advantages, all the other male advantages. Greater cardiac output, greater stroke volume, greater lung capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So even in, what's interesting about ultra distance, if you follow the ultra distance community, some women will actually win races outright. They still will. But it might be because so few people are crazy enough to do this. It's like, okay, who really wants to run 135 miles? You're talking about a very select group of people who mentally are like, yeah, I, could, I can run 135 miles, right? <laughs> so, but here's what I want to do. I want to put this uh, at a female athletic uh, uh, performance in perspective, right? Because you got to compare it to something. <laughs> and for those of you who remember cigarette ads, which I do, um, this was a Virginia Slims ad. Uh, I, apparently, it was okay for women to smoke cigarettes. So they said, hey, you've come a long way, baby. So we could use the same sort of ad campaign for athletic performance in women, right? Because they've come a long way. Now, one of my good friends, Sandra Friend Yule. She's 50 years old. And I like this caption, some people are just better because some people are just better, right? She's 50 years old and she is beating college age women. This was a track meet March 28th of this year at University of Miami. She finished fourth. She's beating 18 to 21 year old women. And my wife ran track, uh, division one track at Drake University. Her and her friends are like, they can't believe she's doing this. Like No one can believe she's doing this. She's 50 years old. She's running at a cra crazy fast pace. In this particular race, she ran the equivalent of a 501 mile. <laughs> For those of you who run, you're like, that's crazy. That's just crazy fast, crazy fast. Now, <laughs> my wife competes in duathlon events, run, bike, run. This is a turtle man duathlon, and she won it outright. You can see her time. She's a... She's a lot faster than the second place person who's a guy. And I don't know if you follow the endurance world, but there's a term that women will use when they beat a guy. They say, you've been chicked. And these girls, they hate the, the guys when they get past, they absolutely hate it. And so in local races, when you get to the local level, women will beat men. In fact, my wife wins a lot of these races outright. But once you get to the national level, uh, there's a separation. Men beat women. Once you get to the world-class level, then it's not even close. But at the local level, you will see this. You will see this. So you can train, I always say, the best women in the world will still beat most of humanity. But the best women in the world will never get close to beating the best men, right? Now, a lot of you may or may not know that I used to be the head coach of a travel softball team. My wife was a general manager. This was our team. This is when they were 12 and under. Um, arrows are pointing to my daughters. Um, I had one daughter that was a pitcher. The other was a catcher. Um, the woman in the middle, her name's Stacy Wilson. She's a 1996 Olympic gold medalist in soccer. I think that's when they beat China. And she used to come on occasion to train the kids. And we always said, we train you guys better than college coaches train you because, well, we do. And we had this annual event where we went to the Deerfield Beach um, baseball team's head coach said, hey, let's have, a, let's have a scrimmage. The girls play the guys, right? But it was in softball, not baseball. So we already knew it was rigged because if you're a baseball player, you're not used to seeing a ball travel from, from a hand, the release where it's at the bottom, and then the ball rises. Baseball players are used to the ball coming from up here and coming down. So in this particular one, this is 2012, we beat the boys 10 to zero. And we beat them every year, like 10 to zero, 12 to zero, nine to zero. And the boys would get all pissed off. They're like, oh my God, girls are beating us. Well, I mean, in a way, if, if you let the boys maybe practice softball, they'd not hit a ball that rises instead of drops. But it goes to show you that female athletic performance is at a very high level. And actually having coached 
and been part of softball for eight years, I can tell you softball is a much more fun game to watch than baseball. It's not even close. Softball is a much faster game. And a lot of people don't realize that. They're like, no, baseball, no, softball is a lot better. But anyway, so this is an example of high-level female athletic performance. And I always say, if you have kids, start training them young. These are my kids when they were little. We, <laughs> we would take them out to the field, and we'd have them do ladder drills, parachute dr uh, sprints, box jumps, med ball throws. Now, <laughs> we never said, hey, we're going to go out in the field and train you. We just said, hey, let's go out in the field, and we're going to play and do stuff. And I remember <laughs> when we used to visit their grandparents in Iowa, um, <laughs> we would <laughs> say, hey, okay, we got to go to the school, and we're going to do sprints. And so we'd, we'd go to the local elementary school, we'd find a hill, and we're, we're going to do hill sprints. And later when they got into high school, they realized, nobody does this. No parents bring their kids to a hill and make them, make them do hill sprints. We were the only ones. I'm like, yeah, but you thought it was normal at the time, right? Doing hill sprints on a vacation. So from a very young age, they learned the value of movement. And to them, it's normal now. They're like, oh, okay, well, you just work out. That's just what you do. Even though one of them hated it, Complaints every day, every day, every day. And now she just does it on her own. I always said, I always, I just told my wife, don't worry, let her complain every day. When she's an adult, she will realize how valuable exercise is. And she does it on her own. And so, in summary, there's a profound male advantage in athletic performance. Number one, world-class women will beat the majority of men and women. Uh, world-class men are typically 10% faster than women in all and all distances. 15 years of age is a magic number. Typically by age 15, boys will outperform every female on the planet if they train. Again, this is the best, these are the best boys. So elite high school boys by age 15 are faster than women, world-class women. And last bullet point, just sort of my advice to you, when your kids can walk, start training them. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Okay. The question is, okay, this will be the last question because we're out of time. It has to do with transgender athletes. Um, if you're dealing with trans men, so these are women, female to male transition, I don't think anyone has a problem. Um, in fact, you don't see any trans men, meaning women to men, doing well in athletic performance. However, when you're dealing with trans females, so these are males to females, biological males to females, I think the particular case you're referring to is Laurel Hubbard, um, New Zealand weightlifter, a male since age 35. So think about this, age 35, she's got testosterone coursing through her body from age 12, so for all those years. And then at age 35, she transitions, right? Those advantages in terms of the strength and power don't suddenly disappear. Now, is it... I guess the question is, is it fair to other female athletes? I don't think it is because, and in fact, this is the analogy. If you're on anabolic steroids as a male, so now we're just dealing with males, you're banned. It's a four-year ban. Why? Because anabolic steroids confer a performance advantage. But now you're dealing with an individual who's literally been on it for 15 to 20 years. Technically, that should be a four-year ban. So if men are banned for using androgens, why would, why would that not apply to the trans female athlete who's been on natural androgens for literally most of their life? Um, so I think we'll see in this Olympics what happens, but in weightlifting and in speed sports, I don't know if you can completely eliminate those, those male and female distinctions. I don't think it'll happen.